All right, let's go ahead and get started. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us for the 2018 tax planning webinar. My name is Austin Shear. I am the manager of digital marketing at Generis and Associates, and I will be your MC on this journey of tax planning. And of course, I'm joined by our very own Dave Betts, our chief success officer. So before we get started, I wanna walk you through a brief tutorial of Zoom. It's the platform we're using right now for this webinar. I wanna make sure that everyone can hear me. So using the controls at the bottom of your screen, please raise your hand or type into the chat so that I can know that you're hearing me. Awesome, it's great to see everybody's hands up. Hi, Audra, hi, Tom. Uh, if you have any questions, or only the panelists are able to use the voice and video functions. So if you have any questions, please type them into the chat. Dave and I will be monitoring this throughout the presentation. For technical questions, we'll assist during the webinar, and any content-related questions will be answered after the presentation during a brief Q&A session. Also, this webinar will be recorded, and following the presentation, we'll be emailing you a copy. During the presentation, we will have some audience participation to keep you active. This will come in the form of polling questions. Like I mentioned earlier, provided we have time, we will host a Q&A session at the conclusion to cover any questions typed into the chat. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panelists. First off, we have our main presenter, Pat Gennaris. He spent 27 years with the firm. He's the managing principal. He's a CPA and an EA. This man's a gosh darn good tax accountant. And rounding off, we have our master of finances, Tim Shaw. He's a five-star professional wealth manager. And this man can cycle for miles. Tim has been with the firm for 15 years as our very own premier financial advisor. So with that, let's get started. I'm gonna hand it off to Pat, who's gonna lead you through this. So Pat, take it away. Thanks, Austin. Now, as most of you already know, we had some major new tax legislation at the end of 2017. Let me start this morning by saying I'm a huge fan of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Now, there are some people that land on the losing side of this law, but the vast majority of us here today are winners, and in many cases, major winners with the new law. There were a lot of changes in the new law for both individuals and small businesses, but today, today, I'm gonna only discuss what I think are the primary changes relevant to your small business that are actionable. In other words, that you could actually do something about. I'm not gonna to try to cover all the parts of the law and I'm certainly not going to try to teach you tax law today. We created this webinar to try to help you know what actions you could take to both minimize your tax and maximize your wealth. So let's start by reviewing the goals that we have for today. First, I want to ensure that where you can take action to save money, that you do so. Uh, I'll do that by discussing the three major areas of the new law that I believe you are most affected by. First, changes to meals and entertainment. Second, changes to asset and vehicle purchases. And finally, the new potential 20% qualified business income deduction. These are the areas where you can most likely make a difference. Next, I'm gonna demonstrate the tremendous opportunity this new law will be for some people by comparing last year to this year. Uh, then I'm gonna discuss how entity planning was affected by the new law. And since the primary choice uh, for most of you is either sole proprietorship or subchapter S corporation, I'm gonna st stress those specifically along with the related reasonable compensation rules. Finally, I'm going to demonstrate how you can use the tax savings that you get from the new law to create even more tax savings and to accumulate some wealth. So let's get started with meals and entertainment. And as the slide indicates, the new rules for meals and entertainment isn't all sunshine and rainbows. That being said, it's not all bad. So first, some good news. Employee parties are still 100% deductible. Also good. Travel meals are still 50% deductible. This concludes the good news I have for meals and entertainment. Now for some bad news. Meals provided for the convenience of the employer are no longer 100% deductible. They're now 50% deductible. Worse yet, beginning in 2025, they're not going to be deductible at all. An example of a meal provided for the convenience of the employer 
would be a staff meeting that you hold at lunchtime. Now, since meetings tend to go much smoother when your staff isn't starving, you make the decision to provide food for your convenience. Another very common example would be the beverages and snacks that you keep at your office for your employees. This is gonna bring me to the ugly news. Feeding and entertaining your clients and prospects is no longer tax deductible. Doesn't mean that you can't continue doing it. I'm sure a lot of us will continue to do it, but since we can no longer take a tax deduction, it may make sense to scale things back a bit. That's gonna bring me to my first action summary. Uh, the best thing you're gonna be able to do to make a difference with meals and entertainment is get with your account manager and make sure we have a method for accounting for each different meal type. This is gonna be especially easy for those of you using Receipt Bank, but if you're not using Receipt Bank, why not? For the love of God, ask your account manager about Receipt Bank. With that, I'm gonna turn it back to Dave for our first polling question. Dave? Thanks, Pat. All right, everybody, thanks for joining us here this morning. And the first poll is, suppose you take all your employees out for a holiday dinner this year, how much of that dinner will be deductible? And we got a hint here to think of this as a holiday party. Looking for some votes to come on in. Okay, the votes are coming. Give a couple more seconds here. All right. All right, excellent. We'll go ahead and end the poll and uh, share the results here. So that's what people had to say, Pat. All right. Oh, it looks like uh, most of you got it right. If you got it wrong, don't sweat that. That's what we're here for in meals and entertainment are a little bit complicated. The correct answer that we were looking for is 100% because it would be a staff party. Um, I would have awarded partial credit to anybody that was thrifty and has made the decision not to feed their employees. Uh, but the correct answer is 100%. Thanks, Dave, and thanks everybody for playing. And that's gonna bring me to assets and vehicles. First, some bad news related to vehicle and asset trade-ins. Under the old law, if you were selling a vehicle or piece of equipment and that sale would create a tax liability, you could have easily avoided those taxes by trading for a similar asset. For example, you could trade your old car for a shiny new car. The new law no longer allows this. So now you're going to potentially owe taxes when you trade in old equipment or vehicles. Given that the smarter play might be to sell the asset because at least you're going to then have the wherewithal to pay the taxes. On to some good news especially if you like buying stuff. The new 179 expense limit is $1 million and the new bonus depreciation is 100%. And basically what this means is if you buy things, we can likely write them off right now instead of over many years. There are some limitations to this, but it won't affect most of us here today. Finally, great news for those of you considering a new luxury auto. In case you don't know the definition of luxury auto, is pretty much any vehicle under 6,000 pounds that is in a taxi cab. Until this year, there were extreme limits on the deductions you could take on these types of vehicles. The best way I could think to demonstrate the impact of the new law is by example. So last night I scoured the internet and I found this previously owned Lexus LS. It's low miles, it's got leather seats, premium sound, it's loaded and it's priced to sell at $52,999. Now let's take a look at the old law versus the new law. Under the old law, buying that car would have generated $15,000 in depreciation over five years, resulting in $4,800 in tax savings. Under the new law, that same car gets you $47,000 in deductions, resulting in $15,000 in tax savings. That's three times the amount of the old law. So we had a very significant improvement to the rules related to luxury automobiles. Uh, that's our next action summary. And here, all you need to know is that the moving parts have changed. So if you're considering trading in equipment or a vehicle, or if you're looking at a lease versus buy decision, give us a call so we can analyze, explain, and minimize any tax consequences. Uh, and that's gonna bring us to another polling question. Dave? Thanks, Pat. All right, all. 
if you are thinking about purchasing a new vehicle in 2018, what might be your best plan? are coming in Give a little bit more time Two seconds and we'll close the poll all right and here's what they had to say all right great um, I am partial to purchasing versus leasing it could make sense because of tax consequence, sometimes the lease, less so now under the new law. The real answer I was looking for was the magic eight ball because I'm always in the market for a functioning magic eight ball and contacting us for information is always a winning choice. So good job, thanks for playing and thank you, Dave. Uh, and let's move on to my favorite part of the new tax law, the 199A business deduction. It's a potential 20% extra deduction on qualified business income. So for example, if you have $300,000 in qualified business income, you could get up to 60,000 in extra tax deductions. That's right. 2018 is a mighty fine year to be a qualified small business. Now our tax law is renowned for its ambiguity and this law is certainly not an exception to that. So we're still waiting for, for them to finalize some regulations that are gonna clarify the new law. Uh, that being said, it would be a big mistake to wait for perfect clarity to begin planning. If you do that, we're certainly going to miss some opportunities. The fact that it's called qualified business income should hint to you that there are some exceptions and limitations, and I'm gonna go over those major limitations now. So on to the fine print. First, large taxable incomes. If you're married, and have over $315,000 in taxable income, or if you're single and have over 157,500 in taxable income, there are some additional limitations. Those limitations are related to wages paid and assets acquired by your business. Uh, of course, we're gonna evaluate those when we're doing your planning, if and where they apply. The second major limitation applies to specified service businesses which are any business reliant on the reputation or skill of its employees. So to give you some examples, stockbrokers, doctors, lawyers, artists, actors, athletes, and woe is me, accountants. Now, if you're a specified service business and your income is under the threshold, no worries. But if you're specified in over the income threshold, we're gonna to need to do some extra planning to try to squeeze some benefit from the 199A. And that's going to bring me to the weirdest exception of them all. Architects and engineers are not specified service businesses. Congratulations, architects and engineers. Your lobbyists are amazing. Uh, and this is a perfect place for this major announcement. Generis and Associates is now an architectural services firm. And good news, existing clients, we're going to give free tax preparation and planning services with all of your architectural consultations. Here's our new invoice. All right, of course I'm kidding. Congratulations again to you real architects. You really made out like bandits. And that's gonna bring me to my next polling question, Dave. Thanks, Pat. All right, everybody. You've just heard about these specified service businesses. Which of these professionals receives the most love from Congress and the 199A deduction? Oh man, the votes are coming in fast on this one. Give another second uh, or two. Boy, this uh, the crowd was ready this time, Pat. Take a look at that. Super smart crowd. That's right. Architects. Congress loves architects. God loves all professionals equally. Congress is partial to architects and engineers. Okay, so let's move on to our tax planning scenario. Uh, I'm gonna use this to demonstrate the huge impact that the new tax law can have. Uh, so for, I'm gonna begin by looking at 2017 versus 2018 in a hypothetical, and then I'm gonna show how we can use some tax planning to create that future wealth I talked about. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our newest tax client. Arthur Fonzarelli, he's married. He files a joint return with his wife, Pinky Tuscadero. 
The Fonz is a sole proprietor who does motorcycle repair from his shop in Wisconsin. One of the things the Fonz brought to us to review was his 2017 income statement. As you can see here, the Fonz had a very respectable income of $237,000 after all expenses in 2017. All expenses except for taxes. We also reviewed the Fonz's tax return. In 2017, the Fonz paid income taxes of $58,000. He also paid self-employment taxes of $22,000. In case you don't know, self-employment tax is simply Social Security and Medicare tax for sole proprietors. That brought Fonzie's total tax burden to just a little over $80,000 in 2017. Now under the new law, even if the Fonz does nothing differently, 2018 is gonna be considerably better than 2017. We did a tax projection and we projected his total tax liability will be $63,408, all else being equal in 2018. So let's look at that one more time. Recapping, original taxes in 2017, $80,198. After the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, his total taxes are projected to be $63,408. Thank you, federal government, for this gift of $16,790, due in large part to the new 199A deduction. The funds didn't come to us just for a tax projection. He came to us for tax planning. So let's see if we can make this even better. Of Fonz's 2018 projected tax liability, $22,000 or 35% of the total is self-employment tax. Now that's a piece of the puzzle we can directly affect through entity and compensation planning. So let's see if we could shave this down. One of the first things I always consider when tax planning is choice of entity. And seeing the Fonz, my first thought was, how about an S corporation? First, let's go over the mechanics of S-Corp tax planning. Uh, if we form an S-Corporation, the Fonz is no longer a proprietor. He's a shareholder. Shareholders are entitled to the profits of a corporation. These profits are subject to income taxes, but they're not subject to Social Security and Medicare taxes. Now, like you, the Fonz is also an employee of his corporation. Employees earn wages. Wages are subject to Social Security, Medicare, and income taxes. We get savings when we can split business income between profit, which is less expensive, and wages, which are more expensive. Now, before you get any ideas, reasonable compensation for shareholder employees is absolutely required. The IRS actually notifies you of this when you get your S-Corp acceptance letter. They make it very clear that they can and will recharacterize your distributions to salary if you fail to take reasonable comp. That would be a very bad day for you because not only would you have to pay 15.3% on all of your income, just like a sole proprietor, you'd also have to pay some significant penalties and interest. So how about reasonable compensation for the funds? Listen, I'll be the first person here today to acknowledge that Fonzie is priceless as an American icon of cool. That being said, we can definitely put a price on the job he does at his motorcycle shop. So what's reasonable compensation? It's based on a number of factors like job duties. Small business owners tend to wear many hats. For example, the Fonz works in his shop as a mechanic, but he's also the janitor, the customer service rep, the landscaper, and the bookkeeper. Time spent, how much time does he spend on each of those activities? Proficiency, the Fonz is an amazing motorcycle mechanic, but he's a terrible bookkeeper. So in the very unlikely event that he could get work as a bookkeeper, he would certainly be paid at the bottom of the pay range for that work. Geographic location, uh, people working in cities tend to earn higher wages than people that work in the suburbs. We can and should do a reasonable comp analysis for all of our S Corp shareholder employees. It's an eight to 10 page report and it analyzes all of the factors that I just mentioned and we use it to defend the compensation we land on for S Corp employee shareholders. 
Here you see the top of the first page of one of those reports for the FONS. In the FONS' case, it indicates a reasonable compensation of $38,609 per year. This is the income statement for Fonzie Cycles Incorporated. It looks an awful lot like the income statement we saw for his sole proprietorship, except that now in addition to his other overhead, he's getting a deduction for his own wages and the employer's portion of the FICA and Medicare on those wages. Before incorporation, the Fonzie's taxes were projected to be $63,408. After incorporation, his taxes would go down to $49,755. That's a $13,653 annual decrease in his taxes from some proper entity and compensation planning. Hey, says the Fonz. Let me pause here and point out that an S corporation is going to work out very well for the Fonz, but that's not gonna be the case for all businesses. In fact, an S corporation is gonna be a dead wrong choice in many cases, especially now that we have this new law. There's plenty of times where a sole proprietorship or single member LLC is gonna be the better choice. The point is there are many parts, many factors that play into tax planning. This was a demonstration, not a recommendation. Uh, and this is my next action summary. Just remember entity planning is made to order. It's certainly not one size fits all. If you're already our client, we're going to be analyzing your entity choice in light of the new law proactively. If you're not our client and would like to talk to us about that, we'd, we'd welcome you to start a conversation with us. With that, I'm going to give it back to Dave, who's going to give us another polling question. Dave? Thanks a lot, Pat. Yeah, just curious for all of you in attendance today, have you had a reasonable compensation analysis done? are coming in, coming in fast. Give it another few seconds here. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the poll and share the results. Looks like we might uh, have a little bit of work to do here, Pat. Oh, that's a lot of people that need a reasonable comp analysis. Excellent. Uh, feel free to reach out to us after the, after the webinar. Again, if you're our client, and you need one, we will proactively uh, bring that to your attention. Okay. So what a tremendous, possibly life-changing opportunity this represents for the Fonz and so many of us listening here today. In the Fonz's case, he's going to have an additional $30,000 a year to work with. It's a very old cliche, but it's also very true. It's not how much you make, it's how much you keep. The Fonz has become a accustomed to a certain amount of take-home pay. If he can stick with that, he can use these tax savings to create some very significant future wealth. So I discussed this all with the Fonz and he said he's cool with the $157,000 that he took home in 2017. The first thing that's going to happen when he invests his tax savings into tax deductible investments like a 401k simple IRA, spousal IRA, or an HSA, is that he will get even more tax savings. We projected the Fonz's tax liability and found that these types of investments would save the Fonz an additional $7,390 in taxes. What's more, these are the kind of investments that grow tax deferred. And so this is the kind of decision and discipline that creates life-changing wealth. What do you think of that, Fonzie? Oh, he agrees. Thanks, Fonz. Now, to give you an idea of what this will look like in reality, we've asked Tim Shaw to model these kinds of investments over a 20-year time period, and he's, he's going to demonstrate three different investment models. And with that, I give you our very own Tim Shaw. Thanks, Pat. Since the Fonz and Pinky are in their 40s, a 20-year time frame is ideal because it will get them to normal retirement age. What I don't know until I interview them is their risk tolerance. So I modeled three separate risk categories for our discussion. First, a conservative portfolio using the American Funds Bond Fund of America. Second, a moderate portfolio using the American Funds American Balanced Fund. Finally, the American Funds Growth Fund of America for our aggressive portfolio. The historical return on these were 7.92, 8.86, 
and 10.48% respectively over the 20 year period. The investment modeling runs various scenarios and determines the low, median, and high potential values of each of the portfolios. As you can see, for the conservative portfolio in blue, after 20 years, the hypothetical value will range from 1.4 to 2.6 million. For the moderate risk portfolio in red, the hypothetical value, future value will range from 1.4 to 3.7 million. And for the aggressive portfolio in gold, the future hypothetical value after 20 years ranges from 1.3 to a whopping $5.2 million. Note, these are not guarantees. This is a scenario modeling software based on historical performance and cannot predict future results. So the bottom line here is that Fonz and Pinky will have between one and $5 million. That's a pretty nice nest egg for them to supplement their retirement. Pat, back to you. Thanks, Tim. And I, I agree. It always floors me how a little bit of planning and a little bit of dis discipline can make a massive difference in, in somebody's outcome. Uh, and so now I'm just going to give you a, a quick summary of what we went over today uh, and the action points. Meals, get with your account manager here. Make sure that we, we know what kind of meal uh, we're dealing with. Assets and vehicles, if you're going to trade, buy or lease, and you need some help crunching the numbers, give us a call. The 199A business deduction. Again, we're proactively looking at that for our existing clients. If you wanna call us with your questions or if you wanna jump ahead in the line, feel free to do so, but we were on top of it. Uh, we did briefly touch on some financial planning topics. Just a reminder, we have Tim Shaw. He's a mouse click away. He could jump into a virtual meeting with you and. and discuss any of the ideas that he talked about today or answer your questions. And finally, if you know anybody that you think we can help that we're not already helping, we would love to do so. We're really excited about the new law. We think it's a big opportunity and, and we'd love to help people save some, save some taxes. Uh, with that, I'm going to hand it back to Austin. He's going to wrap it up. Then if you guys have any specific questions, I think we have a little bit of time to go over those. Okay, Austin. Yeah, thanks, Pat. And thank you to everybody for attending. Like Pat said, if you have any more questions, uh, you can go ahead and get them in now and I'll take them before I finish this uh, conclusion here. Uh, so thank you once again for attending. We will be sending a link to the recording as well as a one-page summary covering the changes to meals and entertainment and also the core actionable points that Pat discussed today. We also have some more information on the funds that Tim mentioned. We also have a survey for you to fill out if you'd like to see any specific information covered in future webinars or just have any general feedback. We love to hear from you. As always, we love helping our clients succeed and we're always happy to help new clients as well. And that could be as easy as connecting with us, like and follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. And if you got something out of this webinar today, maybe just recommend somebody else this webinar. Also check out our blog on our website, we host some great articles there where we cover, uh, aside from financial topics, we mostly cover personal and business success. And with that, that's all I've got. So I think we're ready to move on to the Q&A section. 